Dear Jesus, I want to thank you so much for bringing me to this place to speak these words, to dive into your word and your truth. I've been telling the people who pray for me that this is a big step for me coming here because it's the first time I'm speaking to strangers. And then I show up here and these women gathered around me and put their hands on me and prayed for me like I am a sister. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for the people of God. Thank you for the love that you pour out onto us that then overflows off of us onto the people around. Thank you for how much love from your people has poured onto me. Many people have, have prayed for me with this, this uh, lesson upcoming that you would prepare the hearts of the women to hear it. But Lord, I know there is no one who needs to hear it so much as me. I am the one who needs to hear who you made me to be and what you made me to do. And most of all, that nothing and no one can stop what you want to do with me. <clears throat> Lord, coming up to this day for months, the thoughts keep repeating in my head how pathetic I am. The thought keeps coming that I should just shut up, just shut up and stay in my house where it's, where it's dark and quiet and safe. I pray that you would silence those voices in my head, that you would empower my heart to know the truth and my mouth to speak it and my feet to walk it. In your name I pray, amen. amen. It's all right. I'm going to read out of this book. Any of where it comes from available at living the truth <laughs> <laughs> just to get just to get me started here today um, we are on the last chapter of the book and I I am just astounded once again that people other than me have decided to pick this up and teach a study on it this is chapter 10 entitled the most pointless war in history or if you have the first printing of the book and read it off the bottom, the most pointless war in history. <laughs> in any case, the war is pointless. <laughs> and I am just going to read what it is like when God goes to war off page 337. All of this is from the Old Testament, from... Stories of God's greatness, God's over-the-top awesomeness. When God goes to war, the hearts of the nations melt, knees knock together, and people wet their pants in fear of his coming. Without God lifting a finger or raising an army, his enemies go blind, go crazy, turn on one another, and flee. Without speaking a word, his power is known, remembered, feared, and his enemies come running to him to fall to their knees begging for mercy. Without firing a shot, God is victorious. When God goes to war, nature itself bends to his will. Water defies gravity. The sun stands still in the sky. Donkeys speak, plagues spread, fields die. Water turns to blood and mountains crumble into the heart of the sea. When God goes to war, five men put a thousand to flight. Cars without mufflers turn into tanks and drive off the enemy sight unseen. Admittedly, that one's not the Old Testament. That's <laughs> the weakness is turned to strength, strength to weakness, foolishness to wisdom, and wisdom to folly. When God goes to war, who can stand? If you are a believer in Jesus... If you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, if you have had your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, this picture of what it looks like when God goes to war 
is inspiring. It is confidence building. It, it makes you feel safe because if this God is for us, who can be against us? <coughs> but if you have spent your life <coughs> reading the word of God, memorizing the word of God, studying the word of God, but have never met God, this picture is terrifying. I grew up in a church very much like this. Just walking into this place reminds me of how I grew up with a sea of people who come in the middle of the week to study God's word because where else would we be? Um, I, I loved the Bible, but I loved it for all the wrong reasons. I loved it because it was full of knowledge and knowledge is power but knowledge puffs up. It's love that edifies. And I, I had no love in my heart, not for people. I only loved the truth because the truth was a weapon that I could use. Um, I, could, I could wax eloquent on the doctrine of grace. I even wrote a college paper on the doctrine of grace. But grace had never amazed me. I had never been bowled over by the idea that Jesus died for me. I knew Jesus died for me. I had taught little kids in, in like VBS type things. I had taught them that God loves us, but we are sinners and Jesus died for us. Therefore, I mean, I had my points and I could list them, but they were just words to me. And then one day... I figured out which side of the war I was on, and it was not the right side. I was with the folks who would have said, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? And he would have said to me, I don't know you, and you don't know me. I never knew Jesus. And when I realized that that is where I stood with a God who is mighty, who is holy, who is undefeatable, and who is coming against sin. It terrified me. When I was 12 and my parents came to me and said, Mom has cancer, that was scary, but it was something we were going to get through. When my brother woke me up in the middle of the night to tell me my dad had had a heart attack, that was scary. But it was something we were going to get through together. And on the other side of it, everything was going to be okay. When you find out that God is your enemy, nothing is going to be okay. There is no other side of that. There is no silver lining to that. It is just terrifying. So with this God bearing down on me, here's where I was. I was in... The, the foxhole, and he was coming. And I knew in my head what I was supposed to do is surrender, right? But my attempts at surrender uh, betrayed that I totally did not know what surrender was. I would go to God with a deal. Okay, God, I will surrender, and then for me you will do this. God, I will give you my life and you will save me. That is how it works. An exchange. I trade you whatever. I, w I was going to the impossible to defeat, conquering God with terms. <laughs> and then one day, I was... Um, I was driving back from a therapy session. It was not working. And I was so miserable. I was worried I was gonna drive off the road intentionally to, to kill myself. And uh, I pulled over to the side of the road. I had my laptop with me. I opened it up to try to pull up a movie, just get my mind off of my misery, just just get the tears from my eyes, get the shaking out of my hands, just watch a movie, and then I could get the rest of the way home safely. My computer would not turn on. 
And this was the spot between towns where there is no radio reception. I had no Christian music to listen to. I had nothing but God. And so far he had been silent. And I prayed for a very long time, felt like hours, but, and I don't remember anything that I said because it was all me trying to offer terms to God, trying to surrender, to get the most out of it. Um, in the TV show MASH, um, they, every time the, the politicians would go to the peace talks, and I'm assuming this is accurate to real life, who knows, it's MASH, but every time the politicians would go to the peace talks, they get so many more wounded coming in because everybody was trying to grab up the last little bit that they could before the boundaries were set in stone. That's what I was doing. With one hand, I was over here with God in peace talks, and with the other, I was trying to grab up everything I could. I was trying to retain all the knowledge I gathered, my, my intellect, my right, self-righteousness, everything I had ever done in my life, I was trying to preserve like that had some value and add God to my life, when in reality, I needed to just dump it all at his feet and say, God, I'm lost, what do I do now? <laughs> so at the end of this very long, convoluted, and useless prayer, I prayed the dumbest thing in the history of prayer. I said, God, please don't save me now, or I'll think I did something right. And all of a sudden, that is when the light bulb came on. And the clouds above my car opened and sunlight, I mean, not literally, but that is what it felt like. And for a second, I thought, oh, wait a second. Is that it? I can't do anything right? God has to do it all? Hmm. Grace is oh, free? <laughs> <laughs> This shouldn't have shocked me. This shouldn't have been a surprise to me, but it was the revelation of all revelations. So let me describe to you what that moment looked like on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Here I am in the foxhole, cannonballs whistling overhead, explosions, dirt spraying everywhere. And I am covered in filthy rags. I'm sure you know this, but the verse in Isaiah that says all our righteousness is like filthy rags that literally translates to the rags stained from menstrual impurity. That is about the most disgusting thing <laughs> I can think of. And this is what I had clothed myself in to look good to God. Mm. You can't surrender wearing that. And Jesus, in his robes of white, jumps down into this foxhole with me into the mud and the muck and the blood and sweat and tears. And he rips off a corner of his robe to hand me a surrender flag because I didn't have enough white on me to even surrender. Mm. And so holding my little square of, of, of humility, the God don't save me now or I'll think I did something right, which Jesus put into my mouth, I raise my little flag, half convinced that God is gonna blow my hand off and instead, he looks down into the foxhole and judges me to be his. Mm. He picks me up and he carries me home. And he cleans me up. And he bandages my wounds. And he brings out clothes for me to wear. Here, my son's clothes. I bet they'll fit you. Mm. And he signs with me a peace treaty. And forever, I am on his side now. God of the Old Testament to many people looks terrifying, angry, wrathful, not very nice. And then you read the God of the New Testament and he seems to be all love and, you know, warm and fuzzy. The truth is God did not change. The God who was marching toward me, all holiness and consuming fire, is the very same one who picked me up and carried me home and called me his child. What changed everything is Jesus. Mm, amen. So God is still the God of war. He is still 
as fierce and awesome as ever, but now he goes to war for me instead of against me. This is page 344, if you care. When God goes to war, I have a confidence not my own, a courage beyond my circumstances, and a peace that passes understand me, understanding. Folks, if, if you knew me as well as the people who see me every day know me, as well as my mom knows me, as well as Cameron knows me, you would think I have a split personality. <laughs> if you see me on my normal every day, I am a fearful, anxious, silent and still, hiding in my house, many blinds closed, under the covers, watching TV and beating myself up for all the ways I fail. And then when I stand here, and when I speak the name of Jesus, and when I stand up in front of my church and speak the name of Jesus and sing the name of Jesus, you would think that nothing could stop me. Because God is fighting my battles, and I am not getting in his way on those occasions. Amen. My enemies melt with fear before me, and every fear I've ever felt pales in comparison to the fear of the Lord, present tense when God is fighting my battles for me. When God goes to war, nature itself bends to his will. Mountains move by the power of faith. Water holds my weight. The sun shines through storm and night and rain and clouds. Walls fall and giants topple. When God goes to war, he does it completely. Victory is assured, total, inevitable, and imminent. The God of war has made peace with me and that war is over. And this is what Satan is up against. Mm -hmm. There's a verse. Did I mark it? I do not know. There's a verse which I did not mark. Yes? No, I did not. Where? It says something to the tune of, what king, when he goes to battle, does not first sit down and essentially measure the size of his army against the opposing army. Basically, you don't just go into battle haphazardly. You want to have some assurance that you're going to win. When Satan went to war against God, he either failed to do this first, or perhaps it was like that parable of the scorpion and the frog where the scorpion asked the frog to take him across the river. They get halfway across, scorpion stings the frog, and they're both drowning, and the frog's like, why? And he said, it's my nature. Maybe it was just Satan's nature. Maybe he looked at the size of God and his own size and just couldn't help himself. I do not know. But when Satan went to war against God, he was fighting a losing battle from the beginning. Now, unfortunately, because he knows he's fighting a losing battle, this makes him quite cranky. And in his crankiness, he wants to destroy as many people as he can, drag as many of God's people into hell with him as he can. He's headed for hell, and he knows it. And contrary to popular opinion, hell is not the place that Satan rules. It is his prison, and he doesn't want to go. So kicking and screaming, he tries to grab as many people as he can and drag us in with him. But on the day when driving in our car between radio stations with no TV and the words come out, God, don't save me now or I'll think I did something right. In that moment when, when you and I go from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God, we become untouchable. Mm -hmm. Satan cannot get us. There is no scheme, no number of schemes, no temptation, no number of demons he can send against us that will snatch us out of God's hand. It is impossible. But this does not deter him. Satan still goes after us. When I was writing this book, Identity and Where It Comes From, available at livingthetruth.org. <laughs> Every paragraph, it seemed, I kept bumping up against a huge controversial issue. I bumped up against where we come from. 
six day literal creation or something else. I was bumping up against things constantly. The issue of identity, I think is about as controversial as it gets in today's world. Um, when life begins is an issue of identity. Uh, sexual orientation is an identity thing. Gender is an identity thing. Racism is an identity thing. And then how you feel about yourself is an identity thing, which means depression, anxiety, just about every mental struggle in our society today boils down to identity. And I think I know why. I think it is because Satan has decided this is our weak point. This is where he's going to get us. I believe Satan attacks identity for three reasons. Number one, and I believe some of this was alluded to or even stated previously in the book, but it bears repeating. The first reason, an attack on my identity is an attack on the character of God. Mm -hmm. God is invisible. We cannot see him. We cannot hear him with our own ears. We cannot touch him with our own hands. He is up in heaven, invisible. And so in order to be known, God sent Jesus to walk around on this earth. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, Colossians something. Mm -hmm. He is, uh, what's the other one? Oh, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, also Colossians something. One of them is like 210 and the other is like 19 or 14. I'm just making up numbers at this point. It's in Colossians. <laughs> the point is, everything that God is, all of the incredible vastness that is God, condensed down into human flesh and walked around on this earth so that we who cannot see God can see God because he's walking around. So Jesus, this is what God would say if he were talking to you face to face. This is what God would do if he was living next to you. This is how God would love if he is living amongst you. You want to know what God looks like? Let me draw you a picture. That is what Jesus is, the image of God. <laughs> but shockingly, folks, we bear the image of God too. It was <coughs> created into us when God said, let us make man in our own image. We are created in his image as the entire human race. But then when you and I go from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God, from that day, we are incrementally changed more and more into his image. We look less and less like the old person that we were and more and more like Jesus. So essentially, to a watching world, this should be what God would say if he were speaking to you face to face. This is what God would do if he were living among you. This is how God would love. If he is in your town, in your home, right next to you. So no wonder Satan attacks this. Because to attack this is to attack the God he can't reach. That's right. This is page 349. <clears throat> Satan can't do God any damage. God's shining armor can't be scratched. His glory can't be dimmed. His power can't be diminished, and his plans can't be thwarted. But God resides in heaven, acts invisibly, and speaks inaudibly. And the only way this world knows God is through a book that must be understood by fallible people, by languages that fall short of capturing his infinite character, through creation cursed and corrupted by the fall, and by us through people who can be tarnished, scratched, battered, and beaten up, <laughs> whose reputation can be ruined, and whose ability to reflect God can be compromised. If Satan can corrupt those who bear the image of God, then he can obscure God. 
which to me begs the question. If you had never heard of God, if you did not know at all what he was like, and you were to meet me and to know that I have a God up in heaven, what would you think my God must be like by the way I act? And I'm going to be real honest with you folks. The picture you would get would fall so short of the real thing. Mm -hmm. This is what you would likely think of God if all you had to know him by was me. Courtney Weir, this person right here. Uh, this is page 350 at the very bottom. If someone were looking at me to know who God is, they would see a picture of a God who is here one day and gone the next who is powerful and certain today, able to move mountains and conquer demons, and the next day is nowhere to be seen. If someone were looking at me to know who God is, they would see a God who shows compassion when it's convenient, who takes note of the suffering of others when nothing more important is occupying his attention, who puts principle over people, who demands perfection and condemns anything less, who keeps score of wrongs, who gives up on people when they no longer deserve his long suffering. A God who loves conditionally, who forgives sporadically, who offers mercy to the deserving. They would see a God nothing like the real thing. A God not worth serving, not worth trusting, and a God who, when hope is put in him, disappoints every time. Just glad the Holy Spirit can override what people see of God through me. Amen. <laughs> Otherwise, no one would ever come to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> the second reason I believe Satan attacks identity. An attack on my identity is a bushel over the light of Jesus. Jesus calls himself the light of the world. He is that which is supposed to shine and show direction and, and shine a light on God so that a desperate, lost, dying world will know the way to salvation. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, I can get behind that. I can believe that. This, this I, I believe. But then he says something crazy. And this one I did manage to mark down. This is Matthew 5. 14 and 15, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Yikes. <laughs> a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Um, I believe it's the King James that says under a bushel. But on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If Satan can get me to believe that I am worthless, useless, nobody, then I'm going to act worthless, useless, nobody, if Satan says to me, shut up, and I do. If he says to me, just go home where it's safe, and I do. If he tells me that I'm not good enough, and I believe it. Then I am living my light under a bushel. Um, I'm sure you all know the children's song. Um, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No! I'm going to let it shine. <clears throat> and yet most days, I think I'm living under a bushel. brain got lost a little bit. I'm going to get myself back on track. Ah. Do you want to know something about yourself that Satan does not want you to know? He cannot snuff you out. 
He cannot douse you like a campfire. He can't blow you out like a birthday candle. He can't take one of those fancy candle snuffers and pfft down over the top of you. He can't lick his fingers and snip. He can't <laughs> kill the life that is in you. He cannot. He can't even take a bushel and put it on you. But if he attacks your identity, if he tells you that you are not the glorious, incredible <laughs> creation of God that you are, if he tells you that you are not fearfully and wonderfully made, if he tells you that you are something less than God made you to be, then you just take your little light and crawl under a bushel yourself. He doesn't even have to do it. So he attacks identity so that the world sees no good works, and does not glorify our Father who is in heaven. So that the world, desperate and searching for answers, sees none when they look over here. Because we're under a bushel and the light can't be seen. The third reason Satan attacks identity. <clears throat> An attack on my identity <laughs> is a roadblock in the path of good works laid out for me. <coughs> if it's all right with you ladies, I'm gonna pause and pray. My brain is getting a little scattered and I'm having a hard time following and I feel like I'm going through it too fast. I'm not, lo and behold. <laughs> right on track and Satan has me yeah. convinced I am off the rails. So I'm gonna pray and then we will jump back in. Dear Lord, thank you for being a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thank you for seeing the road ahead when I don't. Thank you for knowing me. When I sit and when I rise before a word is on my tongue, you know it all. Thank you for guiding me in the path of peace. Thank you for adoring me when I feel so not adorable. Thank you for loving me when there was nothing in me lovable. And thank you for guiding me even when I feel lost. I pray that you continue to guide my words and my steps, that your truth would bowl us over, would, would just like a tornado wind, snatch up the bushels that we have crawled under and blow them away so we can't even find them again. Let us know the truth and let the truth set us free. In your name I pray, amen. amen. Back to number three. The third reason Satan attacks identity. An attack on my identity is a roadblock in the path of good works laid out for me. One of my favorite verses, which I kind of laugh even just saying that statement. I have a friend, Mrs. Miller, and she would say one of my favorite hymns, the woman loved every hymn in the book. <laughs> so when I say one of my favorite verses, <laughs> when I say one of my favorite verses, realize that could be followed by about 2,000 different verses. In this case, it is Ephesians 2.10. I'm going to start. Oh, pardon me wants to just read the whole thing. I'm going to start at <laughs> verse 8. Because this is what I had missed for so many years. It bears repeating. For by grace, I cannot believe I missed it. Do you know how many times God says it's not of me? <laughs> Duh! Okay. <laughs> For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. I think it's the New Living that says, For we are his masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God's word, incredible, living, and active, has a whole host of good works in it. But did you know that God has already picked out the ones for you? And they are designed for you. They are designed for who you are. God, who knows what you're good at, who knows what you're not good at, who knows what you love and what you don't, who knows 
your needs, your desires, your skills, who knows best where you are needed, has laid out in front of you a path of good works. Um, I don't know if this analogy will land anywhere in this room, but when I was young, I'd watch my brother play video games, and one of them was uh, Super Mario. <laughs> and you'd pick up coins, mm -hmm. and occasionally they'd just be scattered sporadically, but usually they'd have a trail of coins, especially if it was leading somewhere you wouldn't normally go unless there was a trail of coins. <laughs> that is the picture I have of the good works God has planned out for me. God knows I should go over there, so he has laid a trail of coins. <laughs> And the thing is, if I go over here and miss the, the coins, I miss the good works. Um, and if God has made me to speak, if that's the good work, and Satan tells me to shut up and I do, I miss that one. And then I'm not really sure how to find the next one. And then I can't even see the next one. And here's what tends to happen and if I can find it because I didn't um, mark it down. Okay, oh I did, there we go. This is page 357. Th this is what happens to me when I, well let me back, let me back up a smidge. Um, Satan will tell me I'm not good enough. And so I say no to something I should say yes to. But then I feel like I should do something, so I end up doing someone else's good work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which requires uh, Donkey Kong, not Mario Kart. See, in Donkey <laughs> Kong, you had multiple different characters, and they had to only pick up the bananas of their color. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the banana, you couldn't pick them up. They were translucent. <laughs> you can only pick up yours. I didn't write that in this book. That's good. It's very good. <laughs> All right. She said it's very good. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so here's where I tend to end up. And just listen to this and see if you feel like you've been here before. Mm -hmm. Page 357. If I allow Satan to put a roadblock in the pathway God has designed for me, I will end up lost and going in circles wondering if I've passed this particular rock before. In this place, the sin I've already knocked down keeps coming back and I'm forced to deal with it over and over again. I pray and pray and pray for God to reveal his will for my life. I wallow in purposelessness and confusion. I waste my time on what doesn't matter and start setting artificial benchmarks for myself just to feel like I'm accomplishing something. All the while, the pathway grows less clear as I accept that I am not really who and how God made me to be. I'm going to go ahead and read the next paragraph. This is exactly the kind of army Satan would like to be up against. Mm -hmm. An army not marching purposefully but wandering aimlessly. One so convinced of its inability to take a hill that it does not even try. Mm -hmm. One with so little direction that it is forced to retake the same hill over and over. One so divided and confused that everyone's trying to take everyone else's hill and the front never advances, the cause is forgotten, and the colors are muddied. Once upon a time, there was a city called Sardis. Believe it or not, this is a true story. And Sardis sat up on top of a cliff. On one side, steep cliff. On the other was like a gradual slope up to it. And for hundreds of years, people would try to take Sardis. They would try to assault Sardis. But the thing is, you could see them coming. There was no way to get to Sardis without being spotted. So for the hundreds of years that people tried to take it, it was only defeated twice and both for the exact same reason. The person on watch fell asleep. So Jesus... The last time he was on earth, he came down for a brief chat with John the Apostle, and he asked John to write a, a letter out for him to the church in Sardis. This is Revelation 3, uh, 1. And this is what he says to these people. 
I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up! When you just read that, it, uh, it helps to have the context, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you had lived in a place that had been taken over because someone fell on a, asleep, how would you feel about that person? I mean, if, you're, if, if in the middle of the night, your home got overrun, your family members were killed, how did this happen? Oh, that guy fell asleep? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'd be like, yes, wake up. Satan would have us believe that there is no war going on. Mm. On the one hand, he would like us to believe that, that God is losing the great big tug of war over this earth. But on the other hand, and here's where he's sneaky, he doesn't just tell a lie and over here is the truth. He'll tell this lie, here's the truth, and he'll tell this lie just to make sure you're as confused as possible. So on the one hand, God is losing. It's a hopeless it's a hopeless battle, and that, and we end up fatalistic and depressed. But over here, oh, there's no war. It's all good. You've got your ticket into heaven, and don't worry about anything else. And then we grow complacent and don't notice the fiery darts coming over the wall. Wake up! If at some point... Let me back up. I always thought that the struggle over identity, I guess, was something unbelievers struggle with. Or I did not see how important it was until someone asked me to speak on identity, and I realized, well, I need to write a book in order to speak. So I did. <laughs> and it's like, holy cow, I need to hear this more than anybody does. As much as we could encourage each other to good works, as much as we could speak on, on shining our light before men, that God may be glorified. If we don't get figured out who God made us to be, we're stuck at square one. Mm -hmm. And if Satan can get us to believe that who you are, how you feel about yourself because of who God made, it doesn't matter. Just do all your good works, you're fine. If he gets us to not realize this is under attack, then we are going to be asleep on the wall when the city is overrun. And then everything else that matters gets taken out too. So Satan would like us to believe there is no war for our identity and that it does not matter. But if at some point we recognize, <coughs> oh buddy, this is under attack, he would like us to go fighting the wrong enemy. When the Apostle Paul is speaking of uh, the armor of God, this is Ephesians 6, he leads with, verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It is so easy when truth is under attack to think the enemy is each other. Right. To think the enemy is unbelievers mm -hmm. or believers who have a different belief on something than we do. Mm -hmm. To think that people are the problem. Boy, I so often feel like people are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if this world just didn't have people in it, it'd be such a nice <laughs> place. The truth is, people <laughs> are created by God in his image. He wants to save them. He died for them. He loves them. Believers are our brothers and sisters, not our enemies. But if Satan can get us attacking each other, then we defeat ourselves. In war, there's this side, there's that side, and then there's the guy who profits from the war. He sells weapons to this side and on the sly to this side making sure that they are evenly matched enough to keep fighting each other, and he makes money on the carnage. That is what Satan is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Satan does not just use lies as weapons. He uses the truth as weapons, too. Um, I didn't mark this either. This is Matthew 4. When Satan was tempting Jesus... 
Jesus came back with scripture, that's how we feel like the war should be. Satan tells a lie, we come back with the truth. So Satan figures to can play at that game. And in, uh, let's see, Matthew 4, verse 6. Yeah, verse 6. Uh, Satan said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. That's Psalm 91. As well as I know scripture, and I know it pretty well, Satan knows it better. <laughs> and he uses scripture to tempt. He uses scripture to destroy. He uses scripture to cut people down. And he will sell me the weapons, sell it to both sides, so that we can beat each other up with scripture. When neither side is the enemy, Satan is the enemy. Wake up. That's right. <laughs> Don't fall asleep on that wall. Do not let him tell you either that the unbelievers are the enemy. They are the ones Jesus died for. Mm -hmm. And we are there to bring them the truth that sets free, not to cut them down with it. That's right. Those inside the walls with us, our fellow believers, they are not the enemy. We may disagree. We may put God on display differently. We will put God on display differently. Uh, where is it? Ephesians 4. Um, did I lose all of my Ephesians bookmarks? I think I did. Um, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's four, isn't it? Aha. Starting in verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I'm often diligent about the truth. I'm not often diligent about unity, about listening before I speak about understanding and loving before I judge, or mm -hmm. rather, mm -hmm. let's just not judge, let's just <laughs> love. <sighs> there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one <coughs> baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And I love that that leads into a discussion of how we're different from each other. He gave some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be this, that, and the other, and we're meant to be different. And what was the third thing? Ah. In the history of wars, a lot of soldiers have gone off to war not knowing what started the war, just that their father went to war, they go to war, whatever. In the history of wars, a lot of people have gone off to war not even knowing what it's about. Why are we over here fighting? What, what is it that we're doing here? But as far as I know, in the history of wars, no one has ever gone to war knowing how it would end. Admittedly, sometimes they promise, we'll be done by Christmas, whatever, but no one really knows how it's gonna end. Do you realize what an advantage we have? Mm. <laughs> We know how it started. Satan fell from heaven, wanted to drag as many people with him as he could. We know what it's about. It is about being the image of Christ to people. It is about shining our light before men. It is about following the, the path that God has laid out for us. And Satan wants to stop that. And we know how it ends. This is the last page of the chapter, but I'm reading it off my paper because I can see the uh, <coughs> footnotes better. Before the beginning, God chose me. In the beginning, God created us in his image. 
At my beginning, I was knit together in my mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. At my new beginning, I have been remade into the likeness of Christ. The old things have passed away and all things have been made new. And when all things come to an end, this is my confidence. This battle will end. That's Psalm 55, 18. The war is already won, 1 John 4, 4. I am on the winning side, John 16, 33, and 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Satan will be crushed beneath my feet, Romans 16, 20, and James 4, 7. I am an overcomer, 1 John 5, 4, and 5. Death has no power over me. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. That's the, oh, death, where is your sting yeah. verse? <laughs> I am destined to reign at Jesus' side, Revelation 3, 21, and I will never be defeated. That's Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he also not with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels no principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, Amen. which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for your powerful truth, for your even more powerful love. Thank you for fashioning us for your glory, to put you on display. I love that you have created me the way a potter makes a pot. And I am so grateful that sometimes the pot has to be broken for the light inside of it to shine because I feel broken so much of the time. I pray that you would remind me of the outcome of this war. <coughs> that Satan has no hold over me, that death has no hold over me, that only you hold me and no one can snatch me out of your hands. Thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet, that is a sword in our hand to break chains, and to free prisoners, starting with ourselves. Thank you for the peace that passes understanding, for your love that overflows. Lord, I pray that I would walk away from here today different than I came. More fearless, more confident, more certain, because you have prepared the path in front of me. You have prepared my feet for that path. And that path is designed for who you made me to be. Let me never consent to live my life under a bushel. Not for one day, not for one minute. Not when my life could be shining before men and pointing the way to you. I pray that when people look at me, the God they see is alive, powerful, ever-present, always forgiving, 
that they see the real you in me. That I put you on display so accurately, so well, and so often that no one can walk past me without knowing who you are. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. amen.